Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here are your hosts, John Joseph Adams and David Barr Kirtley. Hi, this is Dave. And this is John. And welcome to episode 75 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is Lois McMaster Bujold, author of the long running Vorkosigan saga a far future adventure series about a military officer from the planet Bariar named Miles Vorkosigan, whose body is weakened due to prenatal exposure to poison gas, and who must rely instead on his exceptional wits. The latest book in the series, Captain Vorpatrol's Alliance, focuses on Miles' handsome cousin Ivan, and is the first book by Bujold to make the New York Times bestseller list. Then stick around after the interview as Mike Cole, author of the Shadow Ops series, joins us to discuss soldiers in science fiction. All right, so let's get to our interview. All right, so we're here with Lois McMaster Bujold. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Okay, so your new book is called Captain Four Patrols Alliance. You want to just tell us about that? This is uh, book um, 14, depending on how you count it, or 16 in the uh, Vorkosiverse series. And it concerns the adventures of Ivan Four Patrol, the uh, titular character. He has been a long-running character in the series. He got his start back in The Warrior's Apprentice, which was published in 1986. And the series and the characters have grown pretty much in real time. Uh, he's now 35 in this book. And the book is, uh, I guess the mode is the easiest to describe. It's, uh, it's romantic comedy and caper novel. Okay, and so this book, it actually takes place a little bit before your previous novel, Cryoburn. Why did you decide to jump back in time like that? It's principally a matter of tone. Uh, Cryoburn was a rather dark book. It was really an extended meditation on death. And I wanted to do something lighter. And if this story were to fall immediately beyond Cryoburn, it would have to deal with the consequences and fallout of all the events that took place in that book. And it just didn't belong in this story. Okay, you mentioned that the story is told from Ivan's point of view, who's a very different character from uh, Miles, uh, who is the point-of-view character for most of the series. Uh, what was it like switching to Ivan's point-of-view? I've actually done Ivan's point-of-view before. Uh, my book called A Civil Campaign, which was published back in 1999, had five viewpoints, and Ivan was one of those viewpoints. So I had, had sort of touched on him before, but had not had a chance to develop him at length. Uh, a lot of people you know, following him through the series as a, as a secondary character who keeps popping up were convinced that he had hidden depths. But I keep saying, no, no, Ivan has hidden shallows. <laughs> Let me show them to you. <laughs> and uh, so that's yeah, part of what this book was about. And then, of course, it had the new viewpoint character, Tej, who is, uh, was a lot of fun to do. Uh, she's from a culture outside of Barrier, which gives her that extremely useful quality of needing things explained to her. It's a an ongoing problem how to make each of my series books stand alone because I've always felt that readers would pick them up at random the way I picked up series books at random back in my youth when I was first getting into things like the Hornblower series. But certainly having a new character gives me a natural way to aid the new reader um, and explain the necessary, what is necessary uh, for them to know. I heard you say that one of the challenges of writing Ivan's point of view is that he actively, he's the kind of character who actively tries to avoid the plot. Oh, yes. <laughs> and what I finally found with him is that basically all the plot twists had to be brought to him by someone else and dumped on him. <laughs> then he would, he would react and he would respond uh, pretty amusingly uh, at that point. At one point, the book kind of went off in a different direction, and it just got slower and slower and uh, harder and harder to write. You know, I was like trying to put Ivan into a Miles plot, and it just did not work. I backed up and found the uh, the turning point and sent him off into a more Ivan-like story, and uh, then everything just fell out swimmingly. So this is the first book of yours to make the New York Times bestseller list. Why do you think this book was the one to finally make the list? I have no idea. I've been sort of floating around. I've been on the extended list since the Civil Campaign. Uh, that was the first time I ever knew there was such a thing as an extended New York Times list. Uh, the New York Times list has the first 12 or 16 places, which are the one you see, you know, plastered all over newspapers and in bookstores for the week, you know, after, after whatever they're counting. 
And then there turns out to be another list that goes from places 17 to 35, which the booksellers got back in the day. It uh, allowed you actually to call yourself a New York Times bestseller if you got on the extended list. But I always thought that was kind of cheating. You know? <laughs> I just wanted to be on the big list. So I think it's probably just a matter of persistence and building my audience, you know, finally up to the point where uh, there were enough of them that would run out and buy the book in one week to uh, to pop it up. It's an awful lot of gaming of the bestseller list that goes on in uh, book promotion, where you try to uh, try to make everybody aware of the book at the same time, try to get to buy them, you know, get it get it noticed, get it uh, visible, which is kind of the opposite to the way I've written. I've not written bestsellers. I've written evergreens. Um, every book I've ever written is still in print. So that's 26 years now. And there are not too many writers that can say that. But I've always had this sort of longitudinal approach as opposed to this sort of vertical bestseller approach. But uh, but I guess persistence pays off. So to what extent do you think the future depicted in the Vorkosigan saga might actually come true? And Bits and pieces, I think it will. Um, now, the uh, the space travel part, I think, is, is entirely bogus at this time. There's no reason to believe that we will ever have cheap, easy interstellar travel. Other parts of it, usually the parts that I concentrate my uh, plots on, are, are more realistic. You know, the biology, the biotechnology, the genetics, and the genetic engineering are more grounded. And I'm also very interested in the impact of biotechnology on the way people could live. The most uh, obvious ongoing thing being the uterine replicator, uh, the idea of extra uterine gestation of human beings and anything else you wanted to, to do with it, which is, I think, a technology that is perfectly possible and will come. It's an interesting technology because it totally changes women's lives and yet doesn't make that much difference to guys. Uh, which is why it, I think, doesn't turn up in science fiction written by men very much. Although uh, the first place I ran across it was in uh, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, which is written and published in the early 1930s. But Huxley used the idea as a metaphor for the British class system, as near as I remember. It's been a long time since I've reread that book. But my uh, exploration of technologies has always been how many things can I do with it, not what is the most dire thing I can do with it. I heard you talking about the, the uterine replicators and saying that really a lot of the egalitarian qualities of our society depends on technology. I think so. I think you know, 99% of women's lip comes from technology making different kinds of lives possible. And then uh, you know, the social adjustment follows the technology. It doesn't precede it. The complaints may precede it, but the change follows. So I think the women who are anti-technology are not as in touch with reality as they ought to be, because technology makes our lives possible. I certainly wouldn't want to live in any prior time. Uh, speaking as a woman, I'd be dead several times over by now. You've also said that you did a lot of research into cryonics for your previous novel, Cryoburn. Uh, what did you learn about cryonics, and what's your impression of that whole endeavor? Well, I... Don't think that uh, they've got it yet. Uh, you know, they can freeze people, but they can't thaw them. Until they figure out how to thaw them, it's kind of uh, kind of fictional. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean they shouldn't be trying. You know, speaking back of, about the history of medicine, there were a lot of things that were tried and you know failed many times before people figured out how to do it. The other aspect of it is, of course, you know, what happens to regenerations down the line when the company disbands, when people aren't interested anymore in, you know, all these frozen people. Many science fiction that stories that involve Quranics involve freezing somebody, sending them into the future, and letting them be our view of this, you know, this future world. But, you know, what, not if it were, what if it were not one or a few, but an entire population? Where would they find room? Who would want them? Who would want to make all this competition? You know? Who wants to draw their grandparents when they could be having grandchildren? Uh, so that uh, Cryoburn played a lot with with those ideas, kind of questioning the whole idea of cryonics from from the other end. Yeah, you know, we want to live forever, but does anyone want us? Okay, so the I mean the series is published by Ban Books, and I know you worked with Jim <laughs> Ban on many of them, and he's someone in the right. field that I never got a chance to meet, and I was just wondering what he was like and if you had any funny stories about him. 
<laughs> oh, Jim, he's an interesting person. I, you know, when I first uh, was picked up by Dane Books, I had I was a young writer out, you know, in the boonies of, of Ohio, had very vague ideas about New York publishing. When I was first called, you know, by Jim Bain to buy my three books uh, that I had uh, admitted, uh, and I had pretty grandiose visions of what a publisher was like, you know, sort of like the Eye of Sauron up in his hmm. tower, you know, minions down below and the engines of destruction churning out books at the bottom level. And eventually found out that actually a publishing company could be six people and a large bottle of Maalox. Hmm. And I was on mine, you know, that publishing wasn't actually like that. Uh, so it's been a, a series of little disillusionments all the way along. Which, uh, all new writers' uh, experiences, they learn more about their trade. But I eventually got to meet Jim. Uh, first time I met him was at an elevator crush in the 1986 Worldcon in Atlanta, Georgia, which is the first Worldcon I had attended as a published newbie pro, in which he scared the heck out of me by, uh, as he was, uh, we were separated by, we did introduce each other, we were separated by the crowd heading into the elevators, that if I could write three books a year for seven years, he would put me on the map horrified me because I'm not a fast writer. <laughs> sort of permanently traumatized there. Uh, but, but can't I write one book a year for 21 years instead? <laughs> That's my response. I can't remember if I said that out loud or not. <laughs> Which, in fact, is what I eventually ended up doing pretty much. So he was an interesting character. He ported my books. Uh, he uh, kept my books in print. Uh, I think uh, a lot of more corporate corporations would have you know, looked at some of my early returns, my early uh, sales figures, and you know, abandoned the series. I think they you know, don't give series nearly as long today as they used to. But Jim developed his writers. He was willing to uh, give them a chance. And when I turned in a book that was 167,000 words long, he said, we'll find the paper somewhere, <laughs> which sort of won my heart. One interesting thing about Bain as a publisher is that they've released a lot of their titles for free in the Bain Free Library. Uh, what's been your experience with that? It's almost impossible to tell. People have um, tapped into it and then read books and sometimes gone on, but yeah, I can't tell how many. So that's, uh, you yeah, know, it can't hurt. Yeah. Heaven knows my books are up for free on all kinds of pirate sites all over the place. Whenever I go online and do an ego sweep, it sometimes seems like nine out of ten of the hits are you know, somebody's pirate site. So, you know, if giving the books away for free sells books, there's plenty of other people who will do it. Yeah, I mean, and so speaking of libraries, I've heard you say that crimes don't tend to happen in houses with lots of books. That was an interesting thing that read struck me very hard. Uh, it was a newspaper article that I read from the Columbus Dispatch way back in the early 90s. I can remember everything about it except the title and author, so I can't find it mm -hmm. again. But it was a, an interview with a forensic pathologist uh, in Columbus, Ohio, and he made the remark sort of in passing that he had never gone into a bad crime scene uh, in any place or house where there were a lot of books. These were all like book-free zones uh, that he was in. People who read tend to commit fewer violent crimes, I guess. And I think that one of the reasons for that isn't just that they're brighter, but I think that books give you a place to go. Uh, they give you a timeout. They give you uh, a different headspace to be in uh, rather than getting more and more frustrated or angry or upset or whatever it is that leads people to these outbursts. So I think that books provide a social service that way for their readers that is like not recognized uh, in your basic literature course. Escape literature gets a bad rap, but I think escape is pretty important for a lot of people in a lot of places. There have been some uh, news stories I've seen recently about studies they've done where uh, reading fiction actually increases people's empathy in a way that nothing else does. I, know if, I was just wondering, <laughs> have you been following that at all? I haven't been following it, but it makes perfect sense. Uh, reading the book is as close as we can get to telepathy, uh, the closest we can get to actually being inside someone else's head for a little while which is not something we can get out of movies or television drama or you know, even real-life encounters. So it just makes all kinds of sense to me. You know, it gives you the practice of seeing somebody else's point of view. So that when you come back to real life, it becomes an idea that's apprehensible to you. 
Okay, cool. So, I mean, ever since Game of Thrones got really popular, I've heard a lot of people say that if you like Tyrion Lannister as a character, you'll also like Miles Vorkosigan. And I know a bunch of people mm-hmm. who started reading the Vorkosigan saga for exactly that reason. I was just wondering, do you, see, do you see similarities uh, between the two characters? Well, I have not read Game of Thrones yet, so I don't know. I must point out that Miles came first. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, I wrote The Warrior's Apprentice in 1984, so do your math, folks. Though I think, you know, possibly that probably that uh, Martin and I were stealing from the same source. I believe uh, Game of Thrones is explicitly uh, somewhat inspired by a Plantagenet history, and Miles is ironically inspired. So, so I think it's a, it's a case of uh, similar sources in this case. Great minds think alike, I don't know. <laughs> and I understand that you've been involved with a Vorkosigan fan group in Russia? Uh, I, I am aware that there is a large Vorkosigan fandom in Russia. They had sent me some pictures, actually, uh, over the Internet, of course, a couple years ago of a, of a LARP, L-A-R-P, live-action role-playing game that they had done over a weekend uh, outside of Moscow, where they had done the Vorkosivers, you know. All these Russian fans dressed up in costumes, you know, playing the various characters and doing some kind of, uh, acting out some kind of story. So apparently they're having a lot of fun with it. Uh, I think the Russian, Russian fandom has found my books approachable simply because of the, the Russian ancestry that I gave Barrier. They were not used to seeing any kind of positive picture of Russia or Russians coming out of Cold War American science fiction. I think it struck a chord for them. And thank heavens I did not fall into the trap of assuming that the Soviet Union would last forever and ever. <laughs> so I did not get jossed, as they say, by the events of the fall of the Soviet Union. So I, I thought it was interesting, you know, according to our Facebook page, our podcast actually has more listeners in Zagreb, Croatia, than anywhere else on Earth. And <laughs> okay. And I understand that you've actually been to Croatia. Could you tell us sort of what the science fiction scene is like there? Yeah, it was very interesting. Uh, Croatia is a very small country, about four million people. But, you know, not a large market by any means. But uh, they have a couple of publishing companies there that are very active translating science fiction. And uh, Algora Tam, which has been translating mine, uh, helped get me over there for the Croatian National Science Fiction Convention. Oh gosh, almost a decade ago now. And it was very fascinating. As, of course, as writer guest of honor, you get treated like royalty and hauled around and sh- all the good stuff. So I had a, had a great time there. The fans took excellent care of me. The fandom, um, because it has a rather narrow pipeline for translated works, which is also the case in other countries with small populations, does a lot of its reading in English. Um, the Dutch read a lot of English. The Finns, I discovered this year, uh, read most of their science fiction in English, and so do the Croatians. So that when I came to do my programs, they didn't even bother with the simultaneous translation or trying to translate them. They just you know, set me up in front of the room and let people <laughs> get out of it whatever they could. I hope they were able to get most of it. I was extremely impressed with the level of English literacy among the Croatian fans. Got to see a lot of uh, touristy things that were just wonderful. Uh, Besides Zagreb itself, which I later stole as a, a town plan for a, a town in the Hallowed Hunt, it took me down to the shore. We saw, you know, we saw the ruins of the the Roman Colosseum by moonlight, and got fed you know, truffles. <laughs> it was a pretty amazing trip. Okay, so uh, that's pretty much it for our questions. Uh, just finally, are there any other new or upcoming projects you want to mention? Not, uh, not at this time. I'm kind of between projects, where I've got things that are not going well enough to make any promises. I'm working on a novella, which I was actually reading from on the book tour, which kind of obligates me to finish the darn thing because <laughs> I've given so many people the beginning of it. And let's think of a middle and an end for this. And I had some other things I was working on in the spring that died, and I'm not sure whether it needs a different approach or, or what. I have no contracts at the moment. I'm in a, an interestingly comfortable place uh, financially. I, Finally got the retirement savings up to the point where I don't, you know, actually need another advance to live uh, until I can finish the next book. So it gives me possibly more artistic freedom than I quite know what to do with. And having to figure out, okay, where, you know, where am I at now if I'm not rushing to get paid, you know, before the lights get turned off? That will be my next challenge, I guess. You know, what is my next phase as a writer? 
All right, great. So Lois McMaster Bujold, thanks so much for joining us on Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Thank you for having me. It was fun. And that was our interview. So thanks so much to Lois McMaster Bujold for joining us on the show. And as we mentioned, for our panel today, we'll be discussing soldiers in science fiction. And we're joined by a special guest geek, Mike Cole. As a security contractor, government civilian, and military officer, his career has run the gamut from counterterrorism to cyber warfare to federal law enforcement. He's done three tours in Iraq and was recalled to serve during the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. His Shadow Ops series has been called Black Hawk Down Meets the X-Men. So, Mike, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. So we're going to be talking about soldiers in science fiction. And first thing people should do is go check out episode three, where we interviewed P.W. Singer uh, about the use of sort of real life use of robots in war. And we talked to, in that episode, we talked about a couple of the classics of military SF, including Ender's Game by Orson Scott Card, Starship Troopers by Robert Heinlein, and The Forever War by Joe Haldeman. And so I guess I'd like to start out just talking about, just sort of do a rundown of what are the, some prominent examples of fantasy and science fiction that feature soldiers. Um, but I think of those as sort of being the top tier. I'm just curious, do you guys think of, can you think of anything else you would consider in that week? I mean, I, first of all, I totally agree with the selections that you've made. And I want to add to those, uh, Robert Butner, whose orphanage was one of the most sensitively told and, and been there novels I've read on military science fiction. Uh, Robert Butner himself was an Army intelligence officer, and also John Henry, a.k.a. Jack Campbell's Lost Fleet series. Uh, John Henry is a retired naval intelligence officer, and he really gets how this sort of uh, uh, bickering and quibbling and, and, and petty bureaucracy that comes into the interplay between um, uh, high-ranking officers plays out in a, in a science fiction novel. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would uh, uh, I would have brought up Jack Campbell as well. and. Um... Obviously, Lois McMaster Bujold, but um, also um, Elizabeth Moon. Um, her Vagos War series is a favorite of mine, and I believe she was a uh, an officer of some sort. I think she was in the Navy, or she might have been a Marine. Yeah, no, she was a Marine. Marine. Yeah, she was a Marine. A lot of the authors in my anthology, Armored, are former military uh, officers and uh, and write military SF. So you know, there's people like Ian Douglas, Dan Abnett. And uh, and some others uh, uh, like you know, well, Tanya Huff and David Sherman um, and and all these people have um, you know various military SF series um, you know in book form. Uh, uh, Robert Butner's in there as well. When you're writing science fiction and fantasy, you're constantly seeking the new and you're constantly pushing the envelope. And so I think that's one of the reasons why I wrote the Shadow Op series is that I didn't see uh, anyone really taking the modern organized military as we know it today in Iraq and Afghanistan and running it out on a fantasy line. That's interesting. I mean, now that you mention it, how many examples can we think of that involve contemporary soldiers with fantasy elements? I mean, there was that um, that John Langan story uh, from your vampire anthology mm -hmm. journal. I'm trying to think of examples of, of military fantasy that deal with modern elements, and I can think more of stuff in comic books. And now, of course, the zombie fiction, which I think of as fantasy, is so hugely popular. Obviously, the modern military is involved in that a lot. But in terms of the traditional fantasy roots that the three of us grew up on, Tolkien, you know, the high fantasy systems of magic, I can't think of any examples off the top of my head other than mine. Well, Mike, since you brought it up, why don't you just uh, describe the premise of your books so people, uh, if they're not familiar with them, they know what you're talking about? Well, the premise of the books is that um, magic has, there's an event called the Great Reawakening and magic, you know, comes back up in the world. And I... Uh, borrowed liberally, shall we say, from the um, status of the mutants in the X-Men universe. People who manifest magic are dangerous, they're not in control, and the government legislates very heavily uh, against it. And the one thing you must not do is use magic on your own. If you do so, you are a selfer and outside the law. And the government establishes uh, the Supernatural Operations Court, or SOC, which is a... Um, it's the, the military branch, uh, uh, the military wing of the United States government that's in charge of administrating and dealing with magic. And uh, they spend most of their time running down selfers and, and bringing them to heel. And the protagonist of the story, uh, who is a company man and serving loyally in the army, comes up latent, comes up with magic, and comes up with a what's called a probe school of magic, a, a, a school of magic that's prohibited by the Geneva Convention. So he doesn't even have the option to join the army. He runs and wackiness ensues. 
I think part of the interest in in stuff like military SF is the idea that when you're doing it in science fiction, it gives you that remove so that you're not actually just reading about fictional contemporary um you know, military engagements, which might be uh, a little harder to be able to just enjoy as fiction because it's like, well, you know, there's actually, you know, stuff like that happening around the world right now. Fantasy and science fiction, it can create, uh, you know, orcs. It can create like the aliens in, uh, in Aliens or in Starship Troopers where you don't feel bad about killing them. It can be problematic in its own ways. But yeah, I do agree that there's this big appeal to military stories. I mean, just going back to the Iliad, I mean, and I think that one thing is that what makes a story exciting oftentimes is how high the stakes are. And you don't get stakes that are much higher than life and death. And that's pretty much what military stories are about, are, are life and death. Yeah, and I think just from a practical standpoint, too, if there are just many different genres of storytelling where your protagonist has to be able to fight, and if they can't fight, you know, the first time your detective sticks his nose in the wrong place, he gets beat up and put in the hospital for a week. The story's kind of <laughs> over, right? Right. I've asked this on many panels. I often challenge the audience, you know, that I off I make the assertion that fantasy and science fiction are inherently violent genres. And I ask them to give me examples of books in fantasy and science fiction that have no violence in them at all. And uh, I think I've maybe heard one or two uh, I would have said uh, Flowers for Algernon. I, I can't think of uh, there being actual violence in that, although I may be misremembering, uh, forgetting some part of it. I mean, if I if I have thought about it, I bet I could come up with a bunch of examples. I mean, like Asimov was a famously kind of pacifistic oriented writer. Uh, he's famous for saying um, violence is the last refuge of the incompetent. Mm. And many of his robot stories, you know, there's no violence in them. They're They're puzzle stories. Uh, I mean, well, I guess since it came up, I mean, how do you feel about that, Mike? There's another similar quote I wanted to bring up. Uh, Ian M. Banks in his novel Use of Weapons, which is a fantastic book, by the way. Uh, he has a character say, quote, In all the human societies we have ever reviewed, in every age and in every state, there has seldom, if ever, been a shortage of eager young males prepared to kill and die to preserve the security, comfort, and prejudices of their elders. And what you, mm. call, her what you call heroism is just an expression of this fact. There is never a scarcity of idiots. Huh. I mean, <laughs> no, I don't agree with it, nor do, <laughs> I, nor do I agree with Asimov's statement that it's the last refuge of the incompetent. I think that um, violence is a tool like anything else, and it's a tool that, if employed judiciously and in a thoughtful manner, uh, can be effective. And there are cases where organized warfare has ultimately benefited society at large and the world at large. I think a lot of people would argue that um, allied resistance to fascism is an example of that. When I was speaking to you before we started recording about Jaish al-Mahdi and about al-Qaeda, there are all kinds of gradients of people involved in those organizations. I mean, I was, I'm, I'm, I, my eyes were not closed to that. There's certainly plenty of people who were launching rockets uh, at me while I was over there who were, you know, 16-year-old kids that were doing it to try to make enough money to you know, pay off the local crime boss in their neighborhood or to feed their sister or whatever. I get that. But at the core of those organizations were committed fanatics who will not rest. They really are like cartoon characters out of B movies. They will not rest until they achieve their goals or until someone destroys them. Granted, those are extremely rare cases, but those cases do exist. And in those cases, I want violence available as a tool to protect myself and, and that which I hold dear. Now, the questions of whether or not that we employed violence justly in those particular conflicts or whether we do in general are bigger questions. But the idea of just with a broad wave of the arm dismissing violence as the, the hallmark of the stupid, I think is, equal, is intellectually irresponsible, to be frank. Actually, just on the subject of pacifism, I just wanted to mention there was a guy I went to the Clarion Writers Workshop with and his parents were both strict pacifists, and so he had been raised to be a strict pacifist. And he said something I've never forgotten, but he said, uh, you know, one thing you learn when you grow up as a pacifist is that pacifists get beat up a lot. <laughs> I think there's really something to that. I was never a pacifist. I got beat up a lot. <laughs> I was up. Yeah, now that you mention it, yeah. Do yeah. Dorks get beat up. Dorks get beat up <laughs> is, the, is the correct term. So. Yeah, I think we can say dorks and pacifists.
give you. Look, I, I just I just feel that zero tolerance policies and extremism on any end of any spectrum is always a bad idea. And that judicious and well-reasoned use of anything is almost, is frankly, I can't think of a single example where it's not the right answer. And that goes for violence along with anything else. All right, cool. So, uh, I mean, the next thing I wanted to talk about is sort of how does having a military background impact a person's fiction? So, I mean, John, I mean, right, you're an editor, you deal with a lot of fiction. Have you noticed a difference between fiction written by people with military backgrounds and not? Uh, well, from an editorial point of view, it certainly makes my job easier when I know that the author has a military background and it's a militaristic story. I know that the details that they're going to have in there are correct. Whereas when the author is, you know, just somebody who likes military SF and, and doesn't have that background, I have to be a lot more vigilant uh, to make sure that um, what they're doing is going to be accurate or, you know, that people with actual military backgrounds aren't going to read it and think, oh, this is bullshit. You know, so sometimes that means that I need to get somebody like uh, like Mike or, or whoever that has a military background to maybe read over a story and say, hey, does this seem legit to you? Um, and, you know, I did run into that with uh, when I was doing Armored because a lot of the people who um, had stories in the book uh, didn't actually have a military background. So, yeah, and I think I mean, I think writing is its own skill. And I've certainly read fiction by people. You know, you read something you're like, oh, this reads like it was written by a 14 year old who's played too much Call of Duty. And then you go and look at their bio and you're like, oh, they actually, you know, are like a combat veteran. But somehow they're not able to bring that authority to the things that they imagine or, or try to, you know, create in a fictional realm. And on the other hand, I mean, there are people who, like Lois McMaster Bujold, when I read her books, I just assumed that she had some sort of military background or came from a military family. And I was actually pretty surprised that, that she doesn't. And, and there's also reader expectations, I think, is a, is a factor in here. The protagonist of my first novel, Oscar Britton, uh, seesaws all over the place as he tries to make, you know, confident decisions. He is pitted with some tough calls and he, he waffles, he hems and haws, he makes mistakes. He, he's all over the map. He, he's very unconfident and uncertain. And I made him that way because that has been my experience with people in the military. And I want, I want to show the reader that there are, different modes of, uh, uh, of experiences. Not every military officer is decisive and confident and, and aggressive. And uh, a lot of people were really unhappy with that. And I, it, of course, I did some soul searching because when you get criticized, your writing is criticized, you definitely, uh, uh, you know, look inward to see, you know, and in the end, I, I, one of the things I really began to think is that readers have a specific expectation of what a military person should be like. And when that expectation is not met, uh, it can piss them off. Do you have an opinion, Mike, on kids playing Call of Duty kind of stuff? Do, do playing games like that prepare people to be better soldiers at all? or uh, It only prepares them to be better soldiers in the respect that so much of the military uh, and military hardware is, is computer-based. I mean, I, I, I honestly think that when these uh, kids grow up and, and become lieutenants and, and sergeants themselves, they're going to be, you know, piloting drones and um, operating remote control uh, ground vehicles to do a lot of the do a lot of their work. And in, in that extent, it's helpful. But in the extent of developing coordination, combat skills, you know, how to how to clear a room, how to work as a fire team, how to um, work with other people, I guess it can give you concepts. But so could reading an article. Uh, in the end, you you have to learn hands on. Uh, and actually, speaking of first-person shooters, uh, I mean, you know, what are, what are your thoughts about Halo um, as a military science fiction game? Uh, I, you know, it's funny. I'm not a big Halo player, but there's one thing that burns me is that the protagonist is the Master Chief. Mm -hmm. Master Master Chief is an E9. It's the highest enlisted rank in the Navy and the Coast Guard, at least in the United States. Master Chiefs are not running around with guns. Master <laughs> Chiefs are at headquarters administering large, you know, numbers of people. When you are promoted that high, either in the enlisted or in the officer ranks, uh, one of the downsides of, of getting up there is, is you're no longer slinging a gun in a hallway. They call him a master chief because they want to show that he's salty and, and, you know, hard as nails and been there and high ranking. You know, if, if you're running through the hallways of a Covenant starship with a gun on your hip, I'd say you'd be a first class top. Yeah, you know who does all the real work? Lieutenant Dante Kirtley, that too. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's exactly right. 
uh, little little uh, joke there. There's a character in the Halo who's named after me. Right, right. Thank you to my good t- friend Tobias Espichel. Uh Well, Mike, you mentioned the the remote control robots and stuff, and that's actually the next topic I wanted to bring up. So, um, what do you guys? I, I sort of wonder, like, when I see uh, the sort the whole sort of Space Marine thing. Are you, when you say Space Marine, are you talking Warhammer 40k? Uh, or or aliens, or I mean. Or Halo, for that matter. I mean, they're all kind of space marines, as far as I'm concerned. I just sort of wonder, will there be grunt kind of troops 200 years in the future? It just seems like the tech is going to make infantry-type soldiers obsolete. Uh, I mean, I don't think so. I I can't see infantry obsolete. I can see this, is that the um, amount of ground that can be held by a single man has been increasing steadily uh, since the Industrial Revolution, and I think that will continue. But I still think you're going to need human beings on the ground to operate these things. Uh, machines are very diverse, and they are very versatile, but there are certain things that only a person can do. And I'll give you a great example. is um, DARPA was demonstrating a uh, robot cheetah. And I'm looking at it, and I'm like, wow, I mean, the future is now. And John Henry uh, told me, he goes, you see that black cord coming out of its back? And I was like, yeah. He goes, that's a plug. He's like, it doesn't have the power source to carry it at that speed for any period of time. The battery would have to be 200 pounds in, in order to hold the charge it would need to do its job. There's a lot of moving parts in technology and a lot of pieces that would have to be very highly developed before human beings could be truly eclipsed from the battlefield. Uh, so I think there'll certainly be an increase in it. But in terms of, as you say, ground pounders being obsolete, not in our lifetime and certainly not, probably not even in our grandkids' lifetime. Okay, but I said 200 years. Oh, 200 years. Wow. I mean, how can I possibly predict? I, again, I'd be really surprised. I'd say, I'd say in 200 years, um, you might have a, you might have a fire team of, you know, two human operators with a cloud of robots around them that are uh, linked to them and integrated to them through interface devices. But I still think there's going to be a human core on the ground. There may be less people. They may be holding a tremendous... You you may have people doing the work of brigades, but I can't see people vanishing entirely. Like, as somebody with military experience, like, you know, does the idea of something like a suit of power armor, like, appeal except uh, in any realistic way as opposed to like sort of oh sure that would be fun to drive around in for a while but i don't know if i'd want to fight in it you know just because like on the one hand if it's working it seems like it would be great but on the other hand if it breaks down or something it seems like you'd be totally screwed because like in something like a tank you know if your tank breaks down or whatever you can have supplies in your tank that will help you survive outside of your tank but like with your power armor it's like if it breaks down it's form fitting i mean where are you gonna where are you gonna fit extra stuff so all I can do is give you my experience. Um, so let me let me do that. And, and this is actually one thing that movies, I think, don't get right, is that real combat and real law enforcement action actually looks really spastic. And watching people go at it, they almost look like they're palsied. Like you, your adrenaline dumps, you lose your fine motor skills, you know, you're flailing all over the place. And a lot of people are trained to operate in that zone because that's where the fighting happens. So because you have this sort of explosive, jerky, off-angle, odd movement, I- I'm not sure how a machine could A, keep up with that, and B, enhance it. Um, now, lighter body armor, sheer thickening fluid body armor, STF body armor, I'd be very interested in. I- again, I also think that we sometimes get, um, we stereotype advances in technology. We expect metal suits, right? I-, I-, I, w- I won't see power armor. But Dragon Skin, for example, tried to take bulky level four body armor. Level four is body armor rated to stop the highest levels of ammunition, 762 rounds. And instead of having a, a single SAPI interceptor plate, sorry, SAPI is a small arms protective insert, they used overlapping scales. Now, in the end, it turned out not to be effective, but it was more flexible. It was lighter. Sheer thickening fluid is a very interesting technology that, I, that I'd love to see more of. Um, the Land Warrior program, which was unfortunately killed, gives troops the ability to shoot around corners. Remember the video cameras that the Marines had on their shoulders and aliens um, and a central command and control unit that's monitoring their vital signs? I think that was very forward-looking. You know what would be the greatest thing in the world? Some way to, disp- to deploy a chemical irritant spray that 
it would be guaranteed not to get on my guys. Hmm. Uh, I'm serious. That would be an incredible technology because a little bit of wind and you just pepper spray drone people. These are the things that are not sexy and therefore don't make it into the movies. But if someone could develop a, a, a technology, some kind of special aerosol delivery mechanism that would make sure that my pepper spray only went where I wanted it to go, no matter which way the wind was blowing, that would revolutionize law enforcement, in my opinion. It just makes me think, I, I heard a guy, a, a guy say once that they asked him what was the biggest difference between real combat and Hollywood. And he said, the biggest difference is that in Hollywood movies, the people who are being shot at always seem to know where their enemies are. And right. like in our experience, like in my experience, we would just be out there and you would just hear gunfire and everyone hits the dirt. You have no idea who's shooting, whether they're, are they shooting at you or are they shooting at somebody else? You know, it's just this mass confusion. Well, but Battle LA does a great job of that. Did you guys see Battle LA? No, no. I heard it wasn't I, very good. Yeah, I heard no, it was no, terrible. No. Well, no, no. I mean, it's, it's not, well, I mean, it's not terrible. It's not great, but, <laughs> but they do one thing right. And, and so, you know, LA gets invaded, aliens, blah, blah, blah. And then the Marines are going in. And there's this great scene where they're transitioning from the safe neighborhoods and, and, you know, getting into the war zone. And, uh, you know, start, they start getting a little nervous and they're looking around and they're hemmed in by these houses and they don't know where the enemy is. And then all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose and they, they're being shot at from a hundred directions. They have no idea where the enemy is. They have no idea where to shoot back. They can't raise their command. It's it's complete chaos, and you're right. The, the movie does kind of have some problems later on, hmm. but that bit, I would argue that almost anybody who watched that film who's got real experience would uh, would agree that that's a very effective portrayal. Like, I love that idea of taking like you know just modern day military and then throwing it into this like science fictional situation and seeing how actual modern day military would deal with it. Well, that reminds me of one, one thing my cousin said when uh, the Starship Troopers movie came out. He's like, the um, American army that fought the Gulf War would have no problem killing these aliens, you know. Mm. But, some, but somehow these guys, you know, hmm. this future army who has like football pads and like really big M16s that don't work very well, you know. Yeah. They, they're, they struggle with the situation. <laughs> It seems to me like military SF is almost exclusively an American form of literature. I mean, uh, like Ta like Tanya Huff is Canadian, but I mean, um, and I'm sure there's probably at least one British writer who who does military SF. But it just seems like I, I can't really think of any any other examples from around the yeah, world. Otherwise, that, that is that is a great point. I had never thought about that before you brought it up. That's brilliant. And and you know what's interesting about it is I can think of a lot of examples of Japanese uh, anime military science fiction stories. Mm -hmm. Voltron and Battle of Planets and Macross. We could go on forever. But that's a very different thing from novels. And I know that military SF is very near and dear to the hearts of the Japanese. I, Jack Campbell is hugely successful over there. So I, that would be the first place I would look. One thing I heard one time that really struck me is that in America, nuclear power creates superheroes. And in Japan, it creates giant monsters that destroy hmm. cities. Mm -hmm. And... You don't have to look very far into the real world history to see the source of that. And I, I think that there, there may be something at work when it comes to military SF, too. I mean, you know, the United States has the most powerful military in the world and spends as much on weapons as the rest of the world put together. And Yeah, I mean, I think there's something to that. We are a, we are a highly military, military culture. Okay, well, I mean, another thing I wanted to talk about is just is war becoming less and less tenable you know we haven't seen a you know a big war like world war ii right since the end of world war ii and it seems like the the number of soldiers involved in engagements just keeps shrinking and shrinking and shrinking All right as is the lives lost uh and it seems like as the world becomes more and more economically and socially interconnected it becomes harder and harder to imagine wars between nations breaking out. I mean, England and France have been at war like for a thousand years. And it's 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 almost literally unimaginable these days to imagine those countries going to war with each other. Uh it becomes more and more hard to imagine the United States and China going to war with each other as the economies become more and more intermingled. So I just I just wonder, is war something that is just gonna it's it's on its way out. Uh, I'd say that Klaus Witzian war is. And I'm gonna. I'm sorry. I'm gonna bore you with a little bit of military theory, but you have to. You have to have it for the uh, for the conversation. And that is that originally, 
officers were raised on this idea of the Clausewitzian trinity from the Peace of Westphalia in the 1600s on, that the way war was fought was uh, three things had to happen. You had to defeat an enemy's army, break his will to fight, and occupy his land. And what's happened now is that warfare, because of the emergence of hyperpowers, uh, especially the United States, there is no army that's going to be able to do that to us. And so instead, belligerents, they attack instead the fact that we're a representative democracy. All they have to do is convince the populace that this isn't worth it. And then the populace will, in turn, through the electoral process, withdraw the mandate from the armed forces to continue the contest. So I think what you're, and this is known as fourth generation warfare. There are tons of uh, books on this stuff. I, I can recommend Thomas Hammes's The Sling and the Stone. Um, General Petraeus's Counterinsurgency Doctrine talks about it. Um, there's a very famous Air Force general named Genghis John Boyd, uh, who's written extensively on the topic. So what I think you're seeing is not that war is decreasing, uh, that war is becoming unimaginable. I'm saying that war is mutating and transforming itself. The idea of Westphalian state-based Clausewitzian war, I agree with you. That's has come and gone. You're going to see less and less of that. And I dream of a day when we'll never see it again. But this new kind of war, this fourth generation war, uh, I think that that's going to continue. And a lot of military thinkers are trying to see what the fifth generation is over the next hill. People of violence is a very tempting way to resolve issues and to gain power. And I, I can't see people abandoning it on a larger scale than one to white fights anytime soon. Okay, but right, not obviously not anytime soon. But, you know, you think about Star Trek or something. I mean, is, is there a future without war in the distant future anywhere? You know, Larry Niven has this series called The Man Kazin Wars, which are about a war between mankind and uh, a sort of feline alien warlike race. And uh, the very first story, which was, I think was one of the very first stories he published, is called The Warriors. And at that point, mankind is, there's complete world peace. People, there's no war anymore. And so people are completely, like, they just don't know what to do when suddenly we get attacked by these aliens. Is this, wasn't the story the basis for the Wing Commander series? The good video game? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, yeah. I mean, the the Kilrathi and Wing Commander are, are like the Kazinti from the Known Space series, with right. like a couple of the letters changed around. Um, right. You know. And, and and but what happens? Is, what, but what it, what it turns out though is that the Kazinti they really effed up by getting humans back into the war fighting mode because you don't want to mess with humans. We show no mercy when we're fighting. Right. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> you right. get us wound up. Okay, but I mean, it sounds like you're saying that states become less and less important, basically. Oh yes, in war. absolutely. So, absolutely. I mean, I, I just will we see wars in the future between sort of self-organized communities online? This is a fanciful example, but like the Mac users versus the PC users, and it. Well, matters. you already have you already have that going on. There are already uh, hacker wars going on in cyberspace. That happens already, and you already see. Uh, gangs in, in uh, city areas uh, going to war against each other. You see intelligence activities that you would think would normally be reserved for real spy agencies going on between corporations. Um, I mean, you, you see all of that stuff, and sometimes it bleeds over into violence. So absolutely, I would expect to see those kinds of things. I mean, look at Anonymous. Look at the power those, that those people wield. Look at um, Julian Assange and what he was able to do. Can can you actually think of any examples of uh of militaristic science fiction that's sort of dealing with the the cyber warfare like you're talking about? Absolutely, Ender's Game, the Ansible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's critical, absolutely critical to that story and how it evolves and the artificial intelligence that is birthed inside the Ansible. I think it's incredibly prescient. Uh, v for Vendetta, Alan Moore's comic book, which uh, later became a execrable movie, but. The comic book, uh, was, it was totally prescient about how, what happens when a state loses the monopoly over the use of force and how the control of information in conjunction with force can be used to, uh, to fr enfranchise the people we would think of as weak to take on, uh, organizations that we would think of as strong. I think both of those, those are two great examples of books that got it exactly right years before their time. I think it's worth mentioning, speaking of Ender's Game, that that has actually been a, assigned as reading in some branches yeah. of the military. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Justly so. Um, okay, so Mike, you mentioned um, General Petraeus. 
and who, uh, you know, uh, recently was forced to resign because of a sex scandal. Mm -hmm. Now, he would be fine uh, if he were in the Starship Troopers universe, right? (laughs) (laughs) Where... You know, I don't, if you, I mean, this is in the book, it's also in the movie, but there's a scene in the movie where two uh, soldiers in a unit are about to have sex and their commanding officer kind of sticks his head in the tent and gives him a thumbs up and, and you know, heads on his way. Yeah, Highline was kind of pervy. Read Stranger in a Strange Land. But, I mean, what do you guys think about that? I mean, are uh, strictures against fraternization going to be a constant feature of the U.S. military or do we see that changing in 100 years, 200 years, something like that? Yeah, I see it eroding. I see it eroding even now. Um, and I think it's unfortunate. I, I was, uh, God, I'll, I, I try not to make political statements, but I was overjoyed when Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed. I, I was, uh, there's never been a prouder day in my life when I got to promulgate that new policy in my unit. But, uh, fraternization, I will say in my experience, does erode good order and discipline in a unit. Um, and fraternization rules, at least in the Coast Guard, I think are written very intelligently. They don't, forbid fraternization between uh, two enlisted people of similar rank that are serving in separate units. And they don't forbid an equivalent relationship among two officers that are in separate units. In fact, that happens all the time. And sometimes there are marriages. But when you're in charge of someone and you have to be making decisions about where they're going to go and what they're going to do, including risking their lives, you got a real problem if, if that's a person that you're having a romantic relationship with. And the other thing is that People are people, and that romantic relationships can be very fraught, and they can end suddenly, and they can go sour suddenly, and they're not like normal friendships in the respect of the impact on people's ability to work together. And military units are not like regular offices. You can't just quit, and you can't just go somewhere else. And the stakes are higher uh, if the job isn't done right. People could die. In the case of General Petraeus, Paul Broadwell was not in his was not a subordinate, right? Well, but but that that issue, okay. That's a totally different issue. That is not an issue of, of fraternization. And uh, this is just my personal opinion. In no way am I speaking for anyone else, especially not the government or the military. But I think it was a damn tragedy. Um, never mind the disposition of documents. Never mind the issue of information exchange. Simply his conduct, which in this case was adulterous, is nobody's business but his own. And the United States uh, is, for better or for worse, a country that's raised on reality TV. And we feel that we have a right to be in everybody else's pants and to know what they're doing and then to pass judgment on it. Uh, what my interest is, is in how effective a leader he was, both first of the Army and then of the CIA. And in both cases, all indicators are very, very high that he was an incredible leader. I mean, the, the coin manual was a huge part of my education as an officer and uh, engendered the deepest respect for him. So to lose him as a leader of the CIA because of that is, is, uh, is, is tough to swallow. Uh, and, but that was not a fraternization issue. This is this woman was not serving under his command. Uh, I don't believe that the liaison happened while uh, they were both in uniform. I think it happened in her capacity as a civilian biographer. That's a very, very different thing than what you're talking about in terms of fraternization in the units. OK, but the military could have sort of a more liberal attitude toward adultery, right? Yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right now. Uh, adultery is a crime under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, which is, uh, I mean, uh, frankly, archaic. Now, I do want to say, whatever my personal opinions may be on any military law, when I am on orders and I am in uniform, I will enforce, I will uphold the, the law. I raise my right hand and I swore that I would follow the orders of my superiors. I'm just reminded of sort of historical examples. I mean, I'm, I, I understand that in ancient Sparta, it was expected that young soldiers would take one of their instructors as lovers. And there's mm-hmm. also this thing I know of called the Sacred Band of Thebes, which was a unit composed of pairs of male lovers. Sure. And they were reputed to be like among the fiercest soldiers. Until Alexander flattened them at uh, Cheronea. I mean, but so something like that would not be permitted in the U.S. military today? Certainly not. Um, and again, one of the problems with the Sacred Band of Thebes is you had a rank difference, too. You had an older... Uh, experienced veteran of, of a higher rank in the military hierarchy and a young, untried person. So if I were to translate that into the rank structure that I know of, and you have, let's say, I don't know, a, a chief, uh, and he's having a relationship with a non-rate, I mean, that's absolutely not okay. And furthermore, the kind of combat that the Sacred Band was engaging in, which is back-to-back, you know, spear-to-spear, shoulder-to-shoulder 
fighting is very, very different from the way a modern military fights. And in that case, a dispassionate and cold professionalism is far more effective than the kind of um, fierce uh, valor that would be kindled by knowing that your lover is beside you. So you think uh, in the future we might see the adultery that might go away, but basically everything else you think is uh, is here to stay? I, I don't think so, actually. I, I think I think we are going to see the liberalization of sexual relationships and fraternization rules. I'm saying that I think that that's a bad idea. In terms of historical trends, we've sort of seen authoritarian systems giving way to democratic systems, uh, but you don't get much more of an authoritarian system than the military. Right. And do you see any progressive reforms being made to that uh, in terms of soldiers being allowed to quit their jobs or having a vote in how they're deployed or, or anything like that? Um, I, I think it's already happening. I, you've never seen such fluidity and mobility as you do in today's military. And what's really f uh, interesting about that is that the difference between the officer class and the enlisted class in the military used to be one of of social class and finance, right? You could buy your rank, uh, you know, your, your dues in the officer's mess were designed to be exorbitantly expensive enough that only gentlemen could become officers. And we tried to perpetuate that kind of class distinction by having the college degree be the dividing line, that people with college degrees and up could be officers and everybody else was enlisted. But with the increase of availability of education in the United States, that's been turned on its head. And you have enlisted guys with master's degrees all the time. And uh, you have incredibly smart people that choose to be enlisted because they want to do the kind of work that they do. I mean, I always joke around when I have a guy in my unit who's like, yeah, I'm thinking about going to OCS and be, excuse me, that's officer candidate school. I always joke around, wow, you really don't want to do anything anymore, do you? <laughs> because as an officer, the vast majority of my life is sitting around do, dealing with paperwork to enfranchise my enlisted personnel who are actually doing the job. So there's plenty of people who they don't want to deal with that crap. So they, they have a master's degree and they stay enlisted because they want to drive boats and they want to shoot guns and they want to, you know, jump out of helicopters or whatever it is they want to do. I just, but you think the sort of rank structure, you, you see that in a hundred years to 200 years or you don't see it? No, no, I see the erosion of the officer and enlisted class and the two emerging. I see that there's probably going to be one rank track. And, uh, and, uh, I definitely see that the, the distinction between officer and enlisted. I think has been obsolete for quite some time. All right, cool. So, uh, I mean, just sort of to wrap things up here, you want to, I mean, you meant, you told us about your books a little bit, but why don't you just uh, say, like, the second one is out now? You want to just say, like, sort of what's going on with those? Sure. Uh, the first book uh, in my military fantasy shadow Op series, Control Point, has been out for about a year, and I'm looking online right now, and Library Journal Reviews just called it, it one of the best books of 2012, so that's great news. The uh, sequel, Fortress Frontier, is going to be coming out around January 31st, so it should be in store soon. And the following book, the last one in the trilogy, Breach Zone, will be coming out a year after that. Okay, then also, John, you know, you mentioned Armored is, has a lot of sort of military science fiction in it. Have uh, anything else that you're working on sort of fit that uh, category? Oh, well, uh, my, my Anthology Federations uh, actually has a lot of militaristic stories in it. I mean, that's sort of the idea... You know, it's sort of a space opera anthology, but, you know, as a result, uh, you know, space opera often has uh, military in it. And so um, a lot of the stories in there have uh, militaristic backgrounds. Like there's a Lois McMaster Bujold story in there, for instance. Uh, and also, actually, my uh, my anthology, Under the Moons of Mars, which is, uh, you know, John Carter of Mars, uh, Barsoom anthology. I mean, obviously, uh, those are all very uh, militaristic, although, um, you know, nothing, nothing bearing resemblance to anything we know in real life. It's all uh, Martian military stuff, but it's a... Uh, uh, um, a lot of the stories are very, um, you know, very, very warlike. So, All right, cool. So I think we're going to wrap things up there. So, Mike, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, guys. It was a great deal of fun. And thanks again to Lois McMaster Bujold for being our guest today. Big thanks as well to Carl Watson for becoming subscriber number 35. To see a list of everyone who's contributed money to the podcast, visit our website at geeksguideshow.com and click on PayPal. Also, we're now up to 214 ratings on iTunes, so a big thanks to Taylor Peters for the recent five-star review. All right, so that was our show. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. 
To learn more about your hosts, visit johnjosephadams.com or davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by Slipgate 9 Entertainment. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.